And I'm really excited about this message. This is one of my favorite parts of uh, David's life because it's just such a mess. And it's, that's, that's how God is. He's at work in our mess. It's messy. And that's how life is. All of our lives are just kind of messy sometimes. And we serve a God, a Savior, who is for those messes, who is with us in the mess. Sometimes we have this picture in our head of a perfect situation, and somehow that's what God expects, and it's not. God is for us in these messy situations of life. And, and he knows that life on earth is like this. So I think you'll see in our scripture for today, there are two roads. It's like there's a fork in the road, and it's going off in two different directions. And these two paths that are available to us, or to David, or to Saul, they are extremely different. They're both very different. And I think we've, we, we've both been down these roads before. You wouldn't know this intersection when you came to it, okay? We've seen where God's path leads our lives. We're walking that now where it's taken us. And we've also seen where self-sufficiency leads us. Where I'm king of my life, where that goes, and when God's king of my life and where that goes. And God's path leads to hope, to challenges, yes, to victory, and yes, even God's path will take us through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's what Psalm 23 says. God's path is going to take us through some difficult areas, but he says, I will be with you in those areas. But we also know the self-sufficiency path. path where I'm in charge. And let me tell you, I am not qualified to be in charge of my own life. I need God to be in charge of my life. That's true. The, the self-sufficiency path is what Saul is walking. And it leads to compromises, paranoia, slowly going against everything we say we believe until we're doing things we never thought we'd do. Can anyone relate to that in your life? Finding yourself in a place where you're doing things you said you would never do. I think a lot of us can relate to that. In this scenario, these two paths, there's two houses being built. One is solid, the other is brittle, and caving in on itself. These are the two paths before us in life. One is the path of David, the man of God. And the other is the path of Saul, the man in rebellion. So David's on the run like we talked about last week. He went to Nob, then to Gath, but now he's found a place to hide out. He is hiding out in a cave. He has found a cave in the desert, and he's hiding in a cave. And I think for us end times Christians, who may one day see the rise of the Antichrist, we may be living in caves one day too. So pay attention. You never know what happens when the mark of the beast is on the earth. You can't buy or sell or even live without having it. You, you, you might have to live in a cave. You may have to live in a cave. I don't know. But it says this in 1 Samuel 22. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. That's cool. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were, were with him. It's nice that his family comes out, huh? David's hiding in this cave in, in Angelum, and his brothers and his dad all come out and they stay with him there. That's good. I like that. My family would often visit me when I was at my internship or when I was at training college. It's nice to have family come visit David when he's in trouble, because previously he was kind of the forgotten one, wasn't he? When, when uh, his dad brought everyone out, when Jesse brought all the sons out, he didn't even bother to bring David, because David was the youngest. He left David with the sheep. <laughs> he's kind of the forgotten one in this story. And he probably feels forgotten again right now in, uh, in the cave. He's, he, he was anointed king. But now he's in a cave. He's hiding in a cave. He's probably looking up at the ceiling of the cave, wondering, 
what has gone wrong with my life? And in fact, there are two Psalms, Psalm 57 and Psalm 142, that if you open your Bible and you look at them, the heading above the Psalm says, when David was hiding in the cave. So he wrote those two Psalms when he was in the caves. Isn't that interesting? So David is hiding in the cave. And he is scared. Because Saul is after him. His family comes and stays in the cave with him. That's good, I guess. And then he starts to gather these outcasts around him. It says people in debt. People who owed money. <laughs> people who were rowdy. People who were discontented. People who were rebels. They gather around David. There's 400 of these guys gathering around David in the cave. Isn't that interesting? He gathers a following. But listen to Psalm 57 here. It says, A psalm of David regarding the time he fled from Saul and went into the cave. <laughs> and it says in this one, Have mercy on me, O God. I look to you for protection. I will hide behind the shadow of your wings until this violent storm is passed. So he sees what's happening in the kingdom with Saul after him as a storm in his life. He's got a storm going on in his life. He says, I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to save me, rescuing me from those who are out to get me. Ah. David is a human being. We might think he's standing in the cave like a superman. Nothing bothers me. I'm living in a cave and everything's perfect. Not when you read the psalm. He's upset. He's crying out to God. He doesn't know what's going on. And we experience the same thing at times, don't we? We're crying out to God. We're afraid and we don't know what's going on. And we're saying, God, help me. He says in verse 4, I am surrounded by fearful, fierce lions who greedily devour human prey, whose teeth pierce like spears and arrows, and whose tongues cut like swords. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. My enemies have set a trap for me. I am weary from distress. They have dug a deep pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. Interesting. My heart, he says, is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises from a cave. Doesn't say that, but I can sing your praises, it says. Wake up, my soul. Wake up. I will wake in the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, in front of all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. For your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. David is singing out to God in the midst of his cave experience. He is alone, pursued by his enemies, but he is praising God in all of that, as he should be. And again in Psalm 142, he says this at the end of the psalm. It really struck, struck me. He said, Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. And he's probably thinking of this cave that God has provided as my place of refuge. But God is really my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. When you're in the cave, you, you figure out pretty quick, all I really have in life is God. Sometimes we get confused, I, I got this house, I got this car, I got this nice stuff. When you're in the cave and on the run, you realize God's all I really have. And all I really need. You are my place of refuge. Hear my cry, for I am very low. David is not on cloud nine necessarily in this situation. He says, I'm very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. See, I bet he is sitting in this cave, 
looking at the walls of this cave and thinking, this is my prison. I'm, I'm, I'm left in prison by my enemies in this cave. Will I, is this where I'm going to live the rest of my life? I bet he's wondering. Wow, that's tough. I've been in jail, and I just you look at those walls and you wonder, is this my life now? Is this going to be the rest of my story? And it's scary. And I'm sure David is terrified. He's on the run. But he concludes like this, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me for you treat me kindly. And indeed, the, the, there was a, a group surrounding him of troublemakers, and he becomes their leader, 400 of them. And they all live in the cave together. His family is there for him too. Uh, the Bible refers to it as the cave of Agilum, but also refers to it as the stronghold or fortress. So, so it may have been an old fortified structure attached to the side of a mountain. We don't really know. It, it may have been kind of a cave slash fortress. I think of like maybe the Lord of the Rings, uh, the two towers, you know, the Helm's Deep maybe. Yeah, yeah. So it may have been a, an old fortified structure. Uh, we don't know. But, but David's character in this situation is that of a leader. Even in exile, even in hiding, people see he's a leader and they want to follow him. And to follow Jesus, brothers and sisters, is to take on the role of a sort of leader. Even if you're not naturally a leader, still, you are now shepherding people closer to Jesus. That's your job now to shepherd people closer to Jesus. And people will begin to look to you, because they know you're a Christian, they'll begin to look to you to guide them toward God. And when they have questions, they may ask you, what do I do in this situation? And you, you're gonna to wanna to have that answer, and I mean you do. It's in the Word of God. Do you see that happening in your own life? Do you see people coming to you? Because you should start to see that. And then I would say you need to begin taking actions to guide people toward God. What sort of actions, you ask? Lieutenant? Well, I'm glad you asked. Simple things. Inviting people to church is one. Bringing people to church is another. Now, there is a difference between inviting someone and bringing someone. There is a difference there. You're bringing someone there next to you, you know, and you, you brought them. Maybe you drove them. I don't know. But there's a difference. Both are, both are good, though. Both are good. Um, sitting down and reading the Bible with a friend is another one. D do you have a friend where you just say, let's read the Bible. Let's, let's, let's go through a chapter of, of, of the Bible together. You and, you and me. Boom. It's not that hard. It's not. You take intentional actions. Do it with your wife. Do it with your husband. Do it with your friend. Do it with your brother or sister. Do it with your neighbor. Do it with someone who you, you kind of want to take that next step. And pretty soon you are a leader. And you're inviting people to Christian events in the community. Remember, Melinda would bring people over for the, for the Christian uh, music over at the amphitheater over there. And that's, that's a good thing to do, you know? Setting up events. Bringing people to stuff. Bringing people to church like Scott does. We, we go, go to a Salvation Army event. We pile in the car and off we go. That's good stuff, and people begin to look to you as a leader like they look to David. But don't be surprised if you don't seem to have many victories at first. That's, understand that as a Christian, it's sometimes hard and not a lot of people are gonna come to Christ. It's not always a season of, of man, they're just, we're hauling them in, you know, and, and the boat's full of fish. Like, sometimes it's like, man, I got like, a, I got like one minnow, you know? And then, it, and then it jumped out of the boat and went back in the water. Like, it's not always easy to be a Christian. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you don't catch a lot of fish. That's okay. You need to show God that you're not going to give up. That's big. God will often put you in a dry season to say, are you going to give up? And in the dry season, you keep going. You say, I'm not giving up, Lord. I'm sticking with it. Because I know we all dream here of bringing, you know, hundreds of people to Christ and bringing millions to Jesus and seeing this revival. But God, God often starts off with very small things done with great love. So just something small done in great love. And those small things are bigger than you realize. Just making someone feel safe, making someone feel at home, 
Uh, giving someone a brief note of encouragement can mean a lot. And do that. Make that your lifestyle. You know, when you're going through the checkout somewhere, look the, look the darn person in the eye and smile and tell them, speak their name to them. They, they usually have a name tag. Say, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, th 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 thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Have a good day. Make sure that you're acknowledging they're a human being. Sometimes we go through the checkout and we just, you know, here you go, here you go, yeah. You know, and we don't treat them like a human being. Yeah, Rebecca, you are not. Oh, that's hey. what I got. Scott, you, you don't do that in church, okay? No, Please no, don't. That's, that's what you'll get. No, no, not in church. So we don't, we don't do that at church. Um, but just be, give encouragement to people. Bless people. Love on people. Give them just a sense that Jesus loves them. Just say, Jesus loves you. Look them right in the eye when you say that. Jesus loves you. Yeah. So, so David is still concerned, though, for his parents. His parents are with him in the cave, but he's like, they're getting older. I don't know if I can keep them safe here. So he knows he can't keep them safe. So then it says in verse 3, from there uh, at the cave, David went to Mitzpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, so he goes and meets with the king, he says, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as, da as David was in the stronghold of the cave. But here's something interesting. It says, the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of, of Hereth. So David has set up camp in this, in this fortress, in this cave, for quite a while. But God tells David, I want you to leave that cave because it's not in the land of Judah. It's in the land of the Philistines. And go back to the land of Israel, which is your homeland. So David ends up with his, his gang of followers. Now they move out of the cave and they move into the forest. <laughs> so now they're in the forest. Now, now, now he's Robin Hood in the forest. He's, he's got his, his band of merry, merry men, right? And uh, he's, uh, he's in the woods now. He, he goes from the cave to the woods. And it's like, okay, is, is that an improvement? I don't really know. Maybe not. So <laughs> he's probably, he sets up some tents. They built some fires, and here we are in the woods now. And David obeys God's command to quickly move to a new area. And here's my second point for tonight. We should be just as quick today to obey God if he tells us to do something or make some change in our lives. Be quick to obey God. That's what David was. He was quick to obey God. We should be quick to obey God, too. Okay? David's character is that he is very responsive to God's will. He's very kind of moldable. He's like, he's like, he's like moldable clay, where God tells him to do something. He's like, yes, sir. Salute, and off he goes. David has that godly character. He's moldable. So three key points for having a heart like David. One, shepherd people closer to God. Be a leader in the lives of the people around you. Two, be patient in obscurity. That was actually my second point. Is be, he, David was patient while he's in the cave. He is patient while he's in the cave. He is patient while he's in the cave. And he's toiling in obscurity. He's meant to be the king, but he's toiling in obscurity in this cave. He's probably wondering, when is my life going to change? Hey, James, can you have a seat right now? Thank you. So, number two is be patient while you wait. But you're patiently waiting on God. Faithfully trust in him with the little he's given you. You know you've got to stay humble, be faithful, and patient. Three, be quick to follow God's leading wherever he sends you. Whatever he calls you to do, do it quickly. Three points. Shepherd people, patiently wait, and obey God quickly. Okay? Shepherd people to Christ, patiently wait on God, and obey God quickly. That's the road of victory in Christ. That's the first road we're talking about tonight. 
the road of victory, the road of patience, of shepherding, of obeying God. That's the road we want to be on in life as people. That's how our hearts should function in God's system when we have the Holy Spirit. This is the great and good road. It's a harder road, but it's a good road. But there is a second road. The second road goes to the left. Um, this is the road of rebellion that Saul is on. Now we turn to that road. Saul is sitting under a tamarisk tree, ranting like a madman. He's got all his leaders there, and he's yelling at him. He says, here now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse, that's David, give every one of you fields and vineyards? Says, you've all been bribed by David. You've all been bribed by David. Like, none of them have been bribed by David. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. He's mad. He's like, you've all been bribed with fields and vineyards. Will you make all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you conspired against me? <laughs> no one discloses to me when my own son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. Remember Jonathan made like a, 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 a pact with David to protect him? It's like my own son has plotted against me. He's paranoid. He's upset. That, that, that part is true, though. So he, I guess he gets points there. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. He says, David could be in the bushes right now, and none of you would tell me. <laughs> what a goof, huh? He's fun. He says, he could be over there right now, and none of you would even tell me. You didn't even tell me my own son was plotting against me. So, <laughs> then answered Doeg, the Edomite, remember this guy? Who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse, David, coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahab, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him the sacred bread of the presence, remember? And the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, Oh boy. This is the guy who saw the priest help David, and he was there, and now he's telling Saul about it. So Saul is so angry. He's a leader, that's for certain, but he is not shepherding his people closer to God. He is shepherding his people toward rebelliousness. Be careful how you live, friends. I'm serious. Be careful how you live, and I got to too. Your life, your words, your actions, your Facebook posts, your Facebook posts, all of it is either shepherding people toward God or toward rebellion. People are watching you. If you're, if you're claiming to be a Christian publicly, guess what? People are watching to see what you're doing. And your actions are either going either to point people to Christ or point people toward Church people are hypocrites. I knew it all along. You know, that's what they're waiting for. I knew it. I knew it. They were full of it the whole time. That's what they want. Don't give them that chance. Be so matching to your Christian lifestyle that they have to say, man, there is something different about them. He, he, he is loving and kind. He, I, I can't find a fault in him to, to accuse him. Maybe there is something to this Jesus thing. Maybe I better go to church. Maybe I better find Christ. We want them in that spot to say, I can't find anything wrong. I like it. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's crazy. It's a, it, that's what we want though, but the, the moment we, we start doing evil or swearing or, or manipulating people, they're able to look and say, ah, I knew it, those Christians are fakes. So watch your actions. Saul is leading his people into sin. Saul calls forward the priest, Ahimelech, and accuses him of helping his enemy. Ahimelech says that he thought David was working for, for, uh, for King Saul, and he was. I mean, at, at that point he wasn't, right? David was on the run, but David did not tell Ahimelech anything because he didn't want him to be accused, but it doesn't matter. Saul is so paranoid and upset, he thinks everyone is scheming against him. Saul orders his officials to kill Ahimelech the priest 
and all the priests. Can you imagine a, a bunch of priests and pastors? It, it says 85 of them. 85 priests and pastors and ministry leaders standing there. And Saul says, kill them all. And Saul's officials say, no. <laughs> uh, he's just bad as here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So his, his officials, though, they don't want to kill the priests. I wouldn't either. I'm not doing that. Those are men of God. So, so Saul gets even more mad when they refuse. And he's like, all right, fine. Doeg, you do it. So Doeg, being this tattletale, well, it's his job now. The king then turned to Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. They killed everyone in the city because of this situation. Even the children, it says. Horrible. An offense. Despicable. So a great evil is done. What began as disobeying God with one thing has become a pattern of behavior that is getting worse and worse and worse for Saul. And he is now in all-out rebellion against God, killing the priests of God. And brothers and sisters, that is how easy the path of destruction is. We start with small compromises, and they lead to bigger and bigger compromises. And pretty soon, we are leading people toward destruction by the hundreds. Instead of shepherding people to God, Saul shepherds people toward evil and sin. Watch yourself and guide yourself against that path. Your example is being watched. Make sure it's a godly example. Second, Saul is impatient and unwilling to listen to reason. David was patient and willing to endure problems and difficulties, and Saul is impatient. He faces problems and he chooses the quick and easy way of lashing out in anger and paranoia. When you face problems as a Christian, and you will, our faith is often tested, right? You must respond to those tests by digging in closer to God. When your faith is tested, dig in closer to God. Dig in deeper. I think of it like a foxhole. I'm in a foxhole on my front line, and the enemy is trying to get me out of that foxhole. Why? So, if I, so I can run the other direction, then I'm out of my foxhole, and he can shoot me in the back. And our, our reaction is often to want to run. Fight that reaction and dig in instead. When they start shooting, you grab your shovel and you dig in another foot down in and you stay even closer to God. You stay even further into your foxhole. Does that make sense? Dig in when the enemy attacks. Don't run, because he'll shoot you in the back. But expect trials and problems and face them patiently. Thirdly, David was quick to obey God and move according to God's plan. Saul is quick to disobey God and harm the people of God. Be quick to do God's will, or you may end up being quick to do evil one day. God hates the beat of those who run quickly to evil. Stop running to evil. Instead, run quickly toward God and his path. So the priests of God are slaughtered by Saul's men. Let's see how the chapter concludes from 1 Samuel 22, verses 20 through 23. But one of the priests escaped, named Abiathar. He escaped and fled to join David. He told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, That day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. One priest escapes named Abiathar. He finds David and seeks help. David does the right thing and he helps him. He takes responsibility for the incident. Even if it wasn't entirely his fault, he takes responsibility for what's in front of him. That's a character trait we all should uh, cultivate. I want to make sure I take responsibility for what is under my care. If something happens in this facility, guess who the buck stops with? This guy. And it is my responsibility in the end. So I gotta, I gotta keep an open, open reality to take responsibility. And we all do for our areas of responsibility. 
We should take responsibility. We should take care of those who are affected by our decisions as well. Take responsibility. That's what a man after God's own heart does, or a woman after God's own heart. You take responsibility for what's under your care. So the main points then, in conclusion, are this first though. What did Saul do? The opposite of the right things. Saul shepherded people toward evil. Two, Saul was impatient. Three, Saul was quick to be rebellious. Four, Saul didn't take responsibility for his actions. Remember, he had Doeg do his dirty work. He didn't pull the sword himself, did he? In contrast, here is our application for today. One, shepherd people closer to God. Number two, be humble and patient in your dry season. Three, be quick to obey God's leading in your life. Just be quick to do it. Number four, take responsibility for the decisions you make and their outcomes. Two roads. One is the way of God, the heart of God, a path leading to eternal life. The second, a road of rebellion, the path of Satan, the rebel heart. A road that leads to destruction, to hell. Which way will you choose? It's your choice. You have the the option to choose either. I've been down both roads. I know where the rebellion roads lead. Destruction, misery, suffering. I, I also have an idea where God's road leads. Also to some difficulties, some challenges, through the valley of the shadow of death even. But God is with us, that's the difference. Let God change your heart. Live in faithful devotion to Christ. Live for Jesus. Then you'll have the Holy Spirit within you to guide you on the path of God, the path of eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we see these two roads before us, the path of eternal life, God, and the path of destruction. God, the path of destruction is easy, soft on our feet at first. The path of God is more rocky. God, we choose your path. We choose the path of life. Even when it's tough. Even when it's making hard choices, God, help the people here, Father, to make those hard choices, to follow you, to choose the right path. Myself included, Father. We give you our hearts. Mold them and shape them, God. In Jesus' name.